So the clinical case scenario for hemophilia could be something like this, which says that a 10 year old boy presents with severe bleeding on minor injuries. There is a similar history of abnormal bleeding among the male relatives in the family and the lab test reveal a normal bleeding time and a prolonged clotting time. The first question itself is what is your probable diagnosis? If you cannot diagnose this, then the second question you are going to get it wrong, which says that what are the characteristic features of the EBO condition. Third question is explain the mechanism of the blood coagulation and last one is name for anticoagulants. So here is a 10 year old boy who is presenting to us with abnormal bleeding that is minor injuries is causing excessive bleeding and there is a similar history of such abnormal bleeding episodes among the male relatives which suggests that this is a X-linked recessive disorder which is running in the family wherein the males are affected and the females are the carriers and even the lab test tells me that the bleeding time is normal because the bleeding time has to be normal because the bleeding time tells me regarding two very important aspects of the platelets that is if the platelets are normal in amount that is the quantity of the platelets whether it is normal or not the second thing it tells me is regarding the functional aspects of the platelets. So hemophilia has nothing to do with the platelets. That is why the bleeding time in this case is absolutely normal. What has happened to the clotting time? The clotting time is prolonged. Of course, when the clotting factors are deficient, the clotting time is going to be prolonged. So what's my probable diagnosis? The probable diagnosis is either hemophilia A or B. Even if I write plain hemophilia, then that's more than enough. What are the characteristic features is what we are going to learn in this video. Explain the mechanism of blood coagulation. I have already made a video on blood coagulation. Have a look at that to understand what to write if this question is asked. Name for anticoagulants, very easy question. We can tell heparin, we can tell warfarin, we can tell EDTA, we can tell sodium fluoride, we can tell double oxalates. Sometimes they will ask you to explain the mechanism of action of any one anticoagulant and therein we expect you to write either regarding heparin or warfarin. Okay. Sometimes this question can be even explain the fibrinolytic mechanism. So now let's understand regarding hemophilia. Hemophilia can be also separately asked as a short note. So what is it that we are going to write regarding hemophilia? So we have to start with a small introduction. Then write regarding the features of different types of hemophilia and at last little bit regarding how do we diagnose it and how do we treat this condition. So coming to the introduction, hemophilia is an inherited disorder. It is inherited in two forms. It could be a X-linked recessive inheritance or it could be an autosomal recessive. It occurs because of the deficiency of the clotting factors. Now, if at all it's an X-linked recessive, then the females are carriers and only the males are affected and characterized by prolonged bleeding even after a very small injury. So let's understand the two important types of hemophilia that is hemophilia A and B. Both hemophilia A and B are X-linked recessive inherited disorders. That means as I have already told, females are the carriers and males are affected. Now, hemophilia A occurs because of deficiency of factor 8 and remember that the hemophilia A is the most common hemophilia accounting for 80% of the total cases of hemophilia. Hemophilia A is also called as classical hemophilia. Next is hemophilia B. It occurs because of the deficiency of factor 9 and it is also called as Christmas disease. Clinical features of both hemophilia A and B. Remember that clinically the features of A and B are not distinguishable. So when I uh, see a patient, I cannot say whether the person is suffering from either A or B. So what are the clinical features? Clinical features is based upon the severity of the disease. The disease could be mild or it could be moderate or even it could be severe. So in cases of moderate to severe disease, what are the features that we see? We see bleeding which is occurring into the joints which is called as hemarthrosis. We see bleeding into the soft tissues and also bleeding which is occurring into the muscles. So this bleeding which is occurring either into the joints or soft tissues or the muscles, if it is moderate to severe, it could occur spontaneously. That means without any trigger or it could occur after a minor injury.
but in cases of mild hemophilia there is infrequent bleeding the bleeding is not frequent and usually the trigger is a trauma until and unless there is a trauma there is no bleeding if the hemophilia is mild so whenever we speak about the severe form of hemophilia there is recurrent hemoarthrosis that means repeatedly there is bleeding which is occurring into the joints and the most common joints which are affected because of this bleeding are the first and foremost is the knee next is the elbow ankle shoulder and the hip joint here we are seeing a photograph depicting that there is a bleeding which has occurred into the knee joint and if there is bleeding which is occurring into the knee joint and if it is very acute then the joint is very very painful okay and here we can see there is a massive swelling okay so there is a massive swelling there is also erythema which is called as the redness so three important features there is pain there is swelling there is erythema and the patient whenever he's trying to move the joint the joint movement becomes very painful that is why the patient is going to adopt a fixed position of the joint so as to avoid the pain in the joint so because of this fixed position what is going to happen is it is going to result in muscle contractures so this is what occurs in acute episodes of hemarthrosis but because of repeated hemarthrosis this hemarthrosis is going to become chronic and when there is repeatedly uh, bleeding which is occurring into the joints the synovium of the joint becomes very thick it results in synovitis which is nothing but inflammation of the synovial lining of the joint and this can cause permanent damage to the joint now how are we going to diagnose hemophilia a and b as i have already told you the bleeding time is normal because bleeding time is giving me a perspective about the platelets whether the platelets are normal in quantity and whether they are normal in quality so there is no defect of the platelets in hemophilia that's why the bleeding time is absolutely normal the platelet count is also absolutely normal what is prolonged is clotting time and then when we do something which is called as pt or also called as the prothrombin time remember that the prothrombin time tells me regarding the integrity of the extrinsic pathway integrity of the extrinsic pathway so there is no abnormality of the extrinsic pathway here in cases of hemophilia a or b that's why the prothrombin time is also normal there is one more time which is called as aptt which is nothing but activated partial thromboplastin time so this tells me regarding the integrity of the intrinsic pathway and because these clotting factors 9 as well as 8 are concerned with the intrinsic pathway that's why the aptt is abnormal and the best way to diagnose whether it is hemophilia a or b is to do what is called as factor 8 and factor 9 assays these will be of course below normal so this is how based upon the laboratory investigations we can diagnose hemophilia a and b now how will we treat these hemophilias best way to treat these hemophilias that is either a or b is to replace the factor that is give factor 8 or factor 9 concentrate second is we can give what is called as cryoprecipitate because cryoprecipitate is rich in factor 8 it is basically used in the treatment of hemophilia a we can give a drug which is called as arginine vasopressin this arginine vasopressin is going to increase the secretion of factor 8 that's why it is also useful in the treatment of hemophilia a but not much in the treatment of hemophilia b and if at all the patient is going for any surgery we have to give antifibrinolytic drugs like tranexamic acid the last type of hemophilia which we should write in the exams it's always good to write this that's called as the hemophilia c hemophilia c is also called as rosenthal syndrome remember that unlike the hemophilia a and b hemophilia c is inherited as an autosomal recessive disorder it occurs because of the deficiency of factor 11 which is a part of intrinsic pathway and hemophilia c is very very rare which occurs in one in a million case whereas hemophilia a and b occur in one in ten thousand cases 
How does hemophilia C present? It presents as bruises, gum bleeding, epistaxis is bleeding from the nose, hematuria is bleeding in the urine and in cases of females, if at all the females are suffering from this disorder, it can also present as menorrhagia. So how do we treat hemophilia C? We have to give what is called as the fresh frozen plasma which is rich in factor 11 and also give factor 11 concentrate. So this is how we should approach a clinical case scenario. Thank you for watching.